So, let us begin Bible study. Start off with Romans chapter 10, please. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Chapter 10, verse 9. Today, we'll be covering a doctrine from soteriology. As you know, we're going through theological studies, many different branches of it. So we're going to cover soteriology, and one of the subjects is confession. Confession. So uh, we're going to look at Webster's 1828 Dictionary first, and then that way we can get the proper definition, or at least you can see that I'm properly defining uh, the word confession. But first thing we're going to cover is confession for salvation. Confession for salvation. So confess what you're going to notice in this whiteboard is that it means the acknowledgement. Yeah. See that? Yeah. Open, I'll stop, open declaration. And then he uses Romans 10, 10 as an example. Now, I mentioned to you Romans 10, 9. That's going to be in line with Romans 10, 10, so don't worry about that. Except some people drawing a whiteboard, they think there's a distinction. But anyway, when we go over here as well, we see in number four that confession is also a formulary in which the articles of faith. So for some of you, you know that in some church websites and other church declarations, they have a thing called statement of faith. That means what particular, which particular doctrines they believe in that they'll teach. So confession is in line with what you believe in. Amen. So it's an acknowledgement. It's a public declaration for people to see and know on what you believe in. Are comprised a creed. So that's your belief. To be assented to or signed as a preliminary to admission into a church. Which some of you saw that with the church membership applications that I gave to you. If you want to be a... Uh, official church member. Now, another thing. Oh, whoa. What did. Oh, 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 I hate that. Okay. Anyway, scrolling down. Okay. I'll have to draw, draw one part again. The acknowledgement. So we see right here how everything has to do with acknowledgement, public uh, confession public decoration from what you believe in. That's very important to understand. The act of acknowledging profession. So in definition number two, it points out that it is a public confession, publicly admitting your belief. That's the whole bottom line with confession. Some people think that confession is just simply Roman Catholic confession. You do the sign of the cross, and then you receive forgiveness of sins. That is not confession. Confession is not some kind of Roman Catholic thing. It is actually, when you look at the Bible, just simply a public thing, a public declaration, profession that you give out of your mouth. And relating to salvation, then it would be a public admit. Uh, a public admittance of your belief in, of your faith in. So that's the first definition is basically acknowledging, acknowledging faith in. That's the first definition for confession. And we're covering the topic of confession for salvation. So if you look at that passage at Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it's pretty simple. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So, in this passage, it points out that this is not confessing sins to a priest, but rather acknowledging faith in what you believe in. You'll notice that Romans 10, 9. Uh, if you're to say it out of your mouth, that's confess, from what you believe in your heart, that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Notice the gospel there, your faith in the gospel. You're supposed to admit it out of your mouth. Go to Luke chapter 23, 
Now, keep your hand at Romans 10. We're going to go back and forth in there. But I want you to go to Luke 23. Here's a great example of a person who publicly admitted out of his mouth, Romans 10, 9, about the Lord Jesus. He recognized his sinful condition. He realized his need of a Savior. And by doing so, that's the reason why he was able to get saved. He confessed to Christ. The famous story that you and I know about the thief on the cross, his salvation is very similar, if not the exact same, at least it is very similar to us in doing Romans 10, 9. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 42, the Bible said, And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And the very famous verse, verse 43, And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So a wretched thief on the cross is able to receive a statement by Jesus Christ without doing any works for salvation, no water baptism. Jesus told him, Today you're going to be in paradise with me. Why? Because of his public admittance that he did. His public admission. His public confession about Jesus Christ being Lord and that he needed a Savior concerning his sinful condition. In the modern Bible versions, you know what they do in verse 42? They get rid of that nugget to align with Romans 10, 9, where you confess Jesus Christ as Lord, recognizing your need of a Savior for your sin problem, because they go in verse 42, and he said unto Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come to your kingdom. Well, that's pretty rude. Number two, he didn't do Romans 10, 9 then. So this verse in your King James Bible is justifiable. It's even better when using the word Lord. Now, can you believe it? But there are some people who are actually, uh, either they are so wicked, completely ignorant. I think it's the former, but if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong, to actually post videos, and then put titles about, you know, the thief on the cross being such a bad example, and it's not a good picture about our Christian salvation. Can you believe that? And they draw whiteboards to do that, and they have the audacity to align themselves with us Bible believers. And a majority of those Bible-believing preachers would reject such a fellow. They do that. And those guys know it, too. That's why... All they can do is just post videos like losers on the internet because that's their only thing that they can do to accumulate followers. They can't do actual church ministerial work to accumulate any follower because these people, what they are is they're rogue from Bible believers. They're solo workers. If they can get anybody to follow them, it's only like a handful of Bible-believing leaders or Bible-believing preachers, very, very few in number. So you got to watch out for those things online. The Internet is filled with so much wrong doctrine and confusion. So, yes, the thief on the cross, he is, like I told you before, not exactly saved the same way like us, recognizing that Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is required for his salvation. Obviously, we don't, uh, he didn't have any idea about it. But nevertheless, we see right here something that's so similar with Romans 10 and 9. That's the bottom line. A very good picture of that. What? He confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, and he ne realized his sinful condition that needed a Savior. What better picture can you get than that? Isn't that a good picture at the very least? Amen. It's a very good picture. People who try to attack that, criticize that, uh, they're very inconsiderate, prideful. They just want to do their own thing. They get nitpicky about these areas that, and make a big deal out of something that's not actually a big deal. They make a big deal out of Bible-believing preachers using the thief on the cross as a good example about our salvation and using that to witness to people. They're very nitpicky. Picky people, I realize. I don't like that. And they criticize yours truly of being critical of people. That's really funny. You know why? It's because of my tone of voice. That's why. That's the only difference is my tone of voice. 
Anyway, when we return back to this chart, this one is uh, produced, I'm sure he won't mind, uh, but from, I think the YouTube channel is KJV Pictures from Brother Lotan, the one who draws a lot of uh, neat cartoons, yeah. kind of like, I guess, a modern version Jack Chick. <laughs> but uh, either, or, uh, either way he is or not, the point is I'm using his drawing right here. He did a very good drawing of Jesus Christ and Romans 10.9 displaying the gospel. He gives the gospel that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And then he gives a picture right here of salvation. Goes like a clock pattern. We see eternity, we see the cross, and then you'll notice the dispensations, or not really dispensations, but different timelines and operations of salvation, which he did, which was really cool. He puts salvation as a center with the arrow going this way, whatever time it fell into concerning salvation. In creation, it was works alone. In the fall right here, faith and works. And then the law, he switches it around where work is more emphasized and faith is uh, less. And then in this timeline of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom. And then ever since his resurrection, to the acts of, uh, middle of the Acts and the Apostles, we see grace with some mingle there with works here and there, but then the gospel of grace, which is our timeline here. So this is our timeline. So then he uses the symbol of the male here, which is by reading Paul's writings. See, the emphasis is on Paul the Apostle, and since Paul wrote Romans 10, 9, then this is our time period here that we go by for salvation. Other people who try to show you other verses in the Bible where Romans 10, 9 is non-applicable for your salvation, then what they are is misunderstanding. They do not know about dispensational truth. Dispensational truth says that those other verses they point out is for different groups of people at different time periods. Us today, we're not in these time periods. We're right here. So this is our salvation. It's really cool how he did it. Like the fall here, he draws a picture of a person falling. And then uh, with the law, he has the balance and scales. And then uh, we see the church is about to form during the gospel of the kingdom. And then Jesus Christ, he died on the cross. The next picture that centered everything on history that aligned with eternity. And he has a symbol of eternity there. And then he's got a cloud right here picturing the rapture and tribulation, which is faith and works. Millennium, a crown, which is works alone. Anyway, uh, that's not part of the teaching, but I want to explain his picture. Does him justice. That way you can understand what was in the mind of the author right here. All right. And if I'm incorrect, he can correct me, all right? And post a video on that. Gene Kim is wrong. That can be the title. That's fine. All right. But uh, anyway, when we uh, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Other verses that show the importance of this confession for salvation and part of it. Part of it, not completely, but part of it has to do with publicly admitting that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's very important. Or more accurately, the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, the Bible says, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God call it Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, so no one can recognize that Jesus is the Lord. No one would give that except what? Except one that has the Holy Spirit inside him, a saved believer. The last part of verse 3 says, but by the Holy Ghost. See that? So that public admission is so important to do that. That public admission, Romans 10, 9, what the thief on the cross said about admitting Jesus Christ is the Lord, where he recognizes that he is the Lord and he compares himself to that, sees his sinful condition, and needs the Lord to save him. That's the whole bottom line here. So this is why 
this is a good verse, and to say the thief on the cross is a bad example, then I wonder what spirit led you to say that. That verse says, no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. What spirit would go contrary to that and have the audacity to post videos on that with that kind of title? And especially align uh, himself or herself with Bible believers, our crowd, and cause more confusion? That makes me extremely upset. You confuse good sheep out there. That's what makes me extremely angry. John 12. John 12. As you know from your pastor, what gets him upset at the most and why he pounds hard on certain internet losers or false preachers, especially scholars and theologians, is because they cause more confusion to people who are watching and listening to that. Nothing makes me more angry than to see innocent sheep who love the Lord, who want to grow in his word, who want truth, but in their search for truth, they stumble if it weren't for that so-and-so there. They would have grown. They would have done something for the Lord. They would have, the, uh, the Lord would have shown them more truth where I could see the Lord using them for something. And right when they are in the verge of truth or they get into truth and they're doing well, then Paul says, who doth hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? He even said, I wish that they were accursed who did that to you. So nothing makes uh, me more upset, just like the Apostle Paul, is people who fumble sheep. And I've seen that in our church, unfortunately, good people stumble. Why? Because if those so-and-sos were not there online or in the churches or give wrong doctrine to begin with. But that's the devil's job, isn't it? When there's truth and a person's growing in it, the devil's job is because that person believes in truth, he's only going to follow the truth. I'm going to have to cloak myself as truth to get them out of truth. That's the devil's job. So that's why it makes me extremely upset is that kind of confusion, confusion. And that's why some sheep, they just don't bother anymore. They just give up because it's just so complicated and hard to find truth now. Why? Because there's just too many lies. Sad, isn't it? Yeah. So that's why you have to pray uh, for souls to get saved. You have to go out soul winning. You have to do what you can to spread Bible-believing truth. And yes, you have to attack the liars out there, the false teachers. Amen. For people to get upset at me, for getting upset at false teachers, to criticize them, it shows me how sad this world has gotten into that for the sake of love and toleration, then you tolerate a lot of more confusion to take advantage of you. A lot of wrong doctrines to take advantage. Oh, they can tolerate me, so let me get in. Let me teach my stuff and cause more confusion. All right, but anyway, let's look at uh, John chapter 12 and verse 42 through 43. Now, this is an important verse to keep in mind. The Bible points out in verse 42, nevertheless, among the chief rulers also, many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now look at right here. You can actually believe, and there are these people who believed, but they didn't confess Jesus Christ. You might say, why is that? Because of verse 43, because they were scared. So that shows right here that this confession is a public admission. See that? It's a public statement. It's not the same as believing. The funny thing is some people who teach, uh, who try to get rid of public confession out of your mouth, they use this verse to justify you can only believe for your salvation, that's fine. But at the same time, they say believing is the same as confessing. Isn't that funny? It points out right here, verse 42, verse 43, how the Holy Spirit does not approve, how he doesn't approve about uh, people who just believe, but they don't confess. Amen. This verse shows a negative tone right here. Because why? Because of fear of people. Because of fear of public. At verse 42 through 43. All right, let's uh, look at uh, Psalm 32, please. Psalm chapter 32. Psalm 32. Ah, Romans 10. I forgot to do this part. All right, go to Romans 10. 
And then your other hand to go to Psalm 32, please. Now, the other thing that I want to talk about concerning Romans 10, which I failed to do. So for some of you who don't know, they're going to, and I never, I don't really spend time doing videos on this because I don't want to start unnecessary confusion, right? I believe already there's already too many disputes online on doctrine. I've, I'm already controversial enough, right? <laughs> so why add fuel to the flame? Especially Bible believers who just want to see Bible believers online, right? So I, I feel uncomfortable uh, calling out and criticizing other people where some people might think them to be Bible believers. So I just don't want to cause unnecessary division, confusion. But if I have to talk about a subject and the Lord tells me to teach on the subject, then if I have to call out something where people are so confused about it and I get endless emails on that one, then I'll have to address the matter, right? So just this part I'm addressing, and I'm only giving the main ideas. That's it. I'm not going to do a thorough examination. If we look at Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, the simple answer and the thing that you want to debunk is some people actually will say Romans 10, 9, when you're confessing out of your mouth your belief in Jesus Christ, that you don't really have to say it out of your mouth what you believe. So they use this to attack the sinner's prayer. Now, I don't like that, okay? Now, there are two wrong doctrines that you have to avoid and then you have to be mindful of, okay? Now, one, obviously, there's a right doctrine, right? Amen. So there's a right doctrine, and then when the, there is a right doctrine, what does the devil do? He always does an out-of-balance thing, correct? Okay, so he always does that. So here we are, sinner's prayer. Romans 10, 9, okay? Uh, more accurately, it's right here, but anyway, I'm just doing that so that visually people can see Jesus Christ and all that. Bottom line is sinner's prayer, okay? Romans 10, 9. You admit out of your mouth what you believe your faith in Jesus Christ, which is why we use the sinner's prayer. Now, that's the right doctrine. People attack, uh, people will attack it or they will abuse it, okay? So... Always look at that. People don't pay attention. Whenever there's a right doctrine from the Word of God, remember you can abuse it or uh, it can be attacked. That's how you can help yourself. Okay, here's good advice. You ready? You don't want to be deceived by a lot of wrong stuff and confusion online and in churches now? Practice this method. You ready for this? Once you get that truth, think about two extremes always. Can there be a wrong doctrine that will attack this? And can there be a wrong doctrine that will abuse this? Right? Okay, you believe in dispensationalism? I do. Dispensational truth. Is there a wrong doctrine that will attack it? That doesn't believe in dispensationalism? And is there a wrong doctrine that will abuse it? Oh, no, no. No one will abuse the right doctrine. There's no such thing. Naive. Naive. And that's how the devil gets you. So, the same thing is done with Romans 10.9. So, let's talk about the abusers. They, you see Joel Osteen, he always says, repeat after me at the end of every message. And after his sermon, you hardly hear anything about the gospel except feeling good about yourself. That's the opposite of the gospel. Gospel is not feeling good about yourself, but rather like the thief on the cross, I'm a wretched sinner. I need a savior to save me from this wretched condition. So here's Joel Osteen after he makes you feel good about yourself. Then he goes on with the sinner's prayer, repeat after me, dear God, I am a sinner, or I repent of my sins. And that's the only thing that he'll put that will indicate any indication at all or any little hint at all about feeling bad about yourself. And then he'll talk about, I believe Jesus died, buried, resurrected, blah, 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 blah. Now let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Okay, let's be fair to him. Let's say everything he did in that prayer is correct. And Romans 10, 9 is correct about using sinner's prayer. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is people now are relying and repeating words for salvation. And they have no idea what those words mean, what the prayer means. Because Romans 10, 9, what does it say? You are saying it from what you what? What you believe. So this is from believing here. 
You cannot believe, and here's another thing, people might believe when they're saying it, but they don't know or understand what they're believing. So here's the issue right here. You got to look at from believing, you got to realize there's a knowing. Do they really know the gospel? That's why in witnessing, it's very important, and I emphasize this, when you're witnessing to people, you got to make sure they understand, they know. You don't have to be technical and give them a theological study, but they've got to at least comprehend and know what each element of the doctrine, why that is important. So if you look at Romans 10, the helpful thing is in Romans 10, 9, right? So uh, I spend so much time on this. Wow, okay, so let me wrap this up quickly. But Romans 10, 9, you're confessing from what you believe in. See that in Romans 10, 9? Is that correct? Yeah. Don't look at me like a tree full of owls. Like I said, look at that verse. Your pastor could be lying to you, right? I'm sure some people watching this online are already doing that because they already got offended by what I said so far. <laughs> All right, so good. Look at the verse, okay? Now, if that's correct, at verse 10, it's from the heart that you believe. And then and, see that? That's added there. So that means this is inclusive. You need to include this. What? You have to confess out of your mouth. And then these both parts is what contribute to salvation. Then you look at verse 11, that if you believe, then you're not going to be what? Ashamed. Ashamed. Why? Because that we're going to find out later on that confession is tied to shame. So you're publicly admitting, but when you're not publicly admitting, you're ashamed. Look at, remember John 12? Remember John 12? See, that shame is there. That's why they can't say it. Then verse 12, it doesn't matter who you are, anybody who what? calls upon God, they'll get saved. Verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now look at that. When you're calling upon the name of the Lord, the author is taking it for granted that the audience knows that is what mouth confession and belief is in. See that? So what is calling upon? Simple. Just look it up in all the time in your Bible. It's, it's praying. <laughs> Even in Old Testament verses yeah. where there were prophets who didn't believe in yeah. Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, the verse said they were calling upon God. So what do you think that means? You think that means they were believing in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? Ha ha. Ha ha ha. What that means, obviously, is they were praying. Amen. So why do you attack the sinner's prayer? All right, so we go back to this extreme. Why do you attack that? That is scriptural. To post videos attacking this, you are anti-scriptural as any anti-scriptural person is out there. So, call upon is praying. What are you praying? Ah, look at right here. From what you believe in. That's important. But it doesn't end there. You have to go from knowing as well when you go back, when you go back. So, verse 14, how then shall they call on him? See, how are they going to pray in whom what? They have not believed. They got to believe in that. And then the next part, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not what? Oh, look at that right there. See that? So they have to hear the word of God. And how shall they hear without a preacher? That's why it's so important for people to understand that when people believe in it, they can't just believe. They have to listen. They have to comprehend. They have to understand. So it is important that people know about the gospel. If people don't know, if people don't listen, if people don't hear, then how are they going to even believe properly? Now, when we uh, go back right here, when we go back to, uh, I mentioned, what was the other passage? Psalm, right? Psalm 32. Okay, we're going to go to Psalm 32. Excuse me on that one. 
So let me wrap this up here. So wrapping it up, we can see that the sinner's prayer is scriptural and that it comes from believing and then it comes from knowing. It can be attacked, which you see people doing that, including some people who call themselves Bible believers, which is too funny for words. And then your video pops up next to Calvinists, people who aren't against dispensationalism, who agree with you. You trouble me. And then you see the other wrong crowd who abuse it. And then people, they're just repeating words in the prayer and think that's salvation. You never want to do that. You want to make sure make sure now here's the thing to get the gospel wrong is to make sure any of these elements are wrong see that you got to get all your elements right so that you can give them the right gospel if you only do believing you only did a part and you gave the the element of the gospel the rest of the elements in the gospel wrongly so then it gives the rest of the gospel wrong that's pretty troubling to me. So I'm not saying those people are not saved, but the thing is, it is important if you want to make sure that the person gets saved correctly, that you give the gospel correctly. So make sure you get all your elements right. To just say believe and you get this element wrong, that's troubling to me. And only getting this element right and this element wrong, troubling to me. And then to get this element wrong, is really troubling to me. Okay, let's go back. We're going to go to Psalm 32 and then verse 5. The next part is confess for forgiveness. Confess for forgiveness. The Bible points out right here, I acknowledged, see that? Conf yeah. Kind of like confession, remember that? We saw that definition. My sin unto thee and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said what? I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Add that with Psalm 51. Uh, add that with Psalm 51. Psalm chapter 51, and then verse 2. Verse 2. Psalm chapter 51. And then we'll read verse 2. Notice a good example of confessing here. What kind of words can I give confessing? Well, Psalm 51 would be a good read then. Notice the psalmist said, Wash me throughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Yeah. That's, I mean, your heart feel that? If you were to say that out of your mouth, you feel that? Those are good words. Verse 3, For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. I like verse 4. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Very good words right there. Even though the psalmist committed evil against Uriah by murdering him, the thing is, David realized, no, the reason why this is wrong is not just because of murder, because morals could be relative if there is no God, right? But because there's a God, murder is wrong. Murder is legitimately sinful. God makes the ultimate difference. So then David realized it's because of you. So when I sin, it's not because I've done wrong to somebody. No, I've done wrong to somebody because you're the one that I sinned against. You're the only reason. You're the only cause. And that's what makes the whole difference with I did sin, I wronged somebody. Does that make sense? Because uh, for some of you who don't know, one of the reasons why God exists, the evidence is because of morals. Who makes the standards of moral? You can't just make up your own standards, then it's relative. Morals are relative if you're the standard. We know that there has to be some absolute standard, absolute reason. The only thing you can say is God. See? Okay, but anyway, uh, I digress. I digress a lot. Okay. We go to... Back to the definition of confess. Uh, oops, oh, I already moved it here. Okay, my bad. Let's go to, uh, back to the dictionary. Okay, so when we go back to the dictionary, remember right here that confession is acknowledgement. And when there is acknowledgement, what is it? Oh, that, all that doodle, okay. 
When there is acknowledgement of a crime, acknowledgement of an immoral action, acknowledgement of a sin, that's where acknowledgement comes in. It's when that happens. So, Roman Catholics, remember they say that confessing is, you know, talking about your sins to a priest and receiving forgiveness. They only gave you a partial definition. We saw on a huge chunk of time earlier, has to acknowledge faith in something. And then now we see a second definition, which is acknowledging of your sin. We see in the bottom right here, acknowledgement of a debt. I don't know if you see that there. Acknowledgement of a debt. Notice right here, disclosing sins or fault. See that? But then he gives right here a Roman Catholic definition because that's what Roman Catholics would see it as. But the bottom line is it has to do with acknowledging of your sins, acknowledging of wrongdoing. So confession does relate to that, which is why Roman Catholics try to take advantage of that meaning, but it's only a partial meaning. If we look at 1 John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, now another thing where I hope I don't go in a lengthy discussion on, because of wrong doctrine, I'm very surprised. When I taught this 10 years ago, it wasn't as bad. Then online came to the scene and then just made these issues, which weren't a, really a big issue, into something major now. So that's why I'm spending so much time trying to explain these basic doctrines. These are basic doctrines. Can you believe that? These are basic doctrines. People even get the basics wrong. It's just uh, sad. That's why it's important that you know your basic doctrines. You might say, why? Because one day some clown online or you come across is going to come across one of these basic doctrines without you realizing it and teach it wrongly. It's just amazing now, all right? Just amazing. Anyway, when we uh, look at uh, uh, this picture here, Good. I like uh, how it demonstrates the example Amen. of, Amen. let's pretend that this is you, uh, when you got converted, right? When you get saved. Yeah. Now, that was your first confession. See that? Out of your mouth. So I like it. It looks like an opening, like a mouth opening. Whether the artist uh, deliberately meant that or not, I'm trying to visually demonstrate that to you anyways. So like out of your mouth, once you confess it, what happens at the same time, which is great, we first talked about confession for salvation. That's the first thing. And then what happens is a growing awareness of your sinfulness and God's holiness is started with your conversion, your first confession. But now as you're walking with Jesus Christ, during your Christian walk, the confession becomes stronger, more bold, in publicly showing what you believe in, but also with receiving forgiveness of sins. Amen. Also with publicly admitting your sins to God to receive forgiveness. Has that not been growing more and more in your walk? If you have a daily habit, this is good stuff, and hopefully we'll come across that uh, real soon, okay, by time. The more you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ, ever since you got saved, you notice that there's more of a confession, whether publicly from your testimony to the lost world, and your sin. More of a confession of your sin as you pray as you grow more in your walk with Jesus Christ. That should be the case after you get converted, is that you grow more in your walk so that you can have, grow more in your confession of your awareness of your sinfulness and God's holiness from your outward testimony as well. It's really good stuff. And then 1 John chapter 1, we are going to examine this text. The reason why it's going to be important is some people are going to teach wrong doctrine to you. Now, the right doctrine for 1 John chapter 1 and then verse 7 uh, through 10. The Bible says the standard text that uh, you want to know about confessing sins is 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 through 9 and 10. That's the standard text you want to know, okay? If you want to know the verse for that. The Bible says, uh, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. And then verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
Great verse. Should be memorized, should be practiced. Except if you're mid-Acts, hyper-dispensationalist. You might say, what's that? What they believe is this, is that they believe in dispensational truth, but they abuse it. Kind of like what I mentioned before. So they think that 1 John cannot be applicable to Christians. They think that has to be only tribulation Jews. That's hogwash. Well, you're going to find out in 1 John 1, uh, 1 John 1, 1 John itself, you're going to find out doctrinal applications to both parties. All right? But I'm not going to get on an apologetic spree on that one. I do that enough in Hebrews. And then uh, one day I'll post a video on that one. All right? But anyway, in this verse right here, they're, that's their rationale. This is for tribulation Jews, so they got to practice this. There are several problems with this, okay? Several problems with this argument is, one, 1 John 7 and 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? Oh. All unrighteousness. What is the standard sin during the tribulation? Mark of the beast. So after you receive it, you think you're going to get forgiven then by, I have the mark of the beast, but if I confess my sin and plead the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll wash it away. Don't make sense. Don't make sense. All right. Now, if I'm going to be extremely uh, lenient and I'm always open to possibilities, only way to get around it if you don't have the mark, right? So... And as a matter of fact, that's why, sadly, because people don't know dispensational truth, there are reports of people who think they got the mark of the beast, so they've been cutting their hands off and then ripping some stuff off their forehead, all right? So, so even they know the common sense of, hey, that thing is going to get me to hell, so I need to dismember that part out. So to be extremely lenient, if you don't have that mark, you know, stuff like that, even people by common sense realize, I'm going to go to hell if I have this, so i got to get it off of me. But the bottom line is, just confessing your sin ain't going to get rid of that mark of the beast, okay? And pleading the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know how many millions, mid-acts, you're going to damn Come on. by teaching something like that? And they go buying and selling food with that mark of the beast, and they think they can practice the same thing like a saved Christian does. As long as I confess the blood of Jesus Christ, I'll be okay. Wow. All right. So that's big right there. Okay. So, no. You see this more as church age application. The second thing to debunk this is notice right here it has to do with Christian what? Fellowship. It has to do about walk in darkness. Now, here's the thing. Yes. You can apply that to a tribulation saint. Fine. All right? But can't a Christian qualify for this as well? If a, I have a question for you. If a Christian has fellowship with God, which mid-acts can admit, and Christians have a walk with God, which mid-acts uh, mid, mid will admit, then why in the uh, land of common sense right here would God say, don't you dare confess your sins to me? I don't care if God said this to somebody else. If I'm committing the same things like that person will do, I might at least consider, even if I don't have a scriptural verse, if God wants that for that person, which I'm following the wrong, same wrong things, I think God might get on me for that wow. one. Amen. And what he'd want from that person, I'm sure he might want the same with me too. Good. For example, okay, if... Your mom, all right, doesn't like your brother always coming inside the house smelly and dirty. You don't care if the brother is different from you, if your brother is a different dispensation from you, if your brother's a Jew or a Gentile. You don't care. And you don't care if your mom never told you that, all right? And your mom only told your brother, only told your brother that, hey, because you smell and you sting in the house, I don't like that in the house. Make sure you shower. In the land of common sense, won't you think? I think my mom would want me to take a shower too if I smell. Amen. God only told the Old Testament Jews, don't, don't prostitute your daughter. You think that uh, God would, wouldn't want you to do that too? <laughs> so then how do you rightly divide things? It's so simple. You divide when there's a contradiction. When there's a statement made to one party that contradicts you, yeah. that's when you know, oh, it's only for that person, not for me. 
That's just even common sense, too. Okay. Uh, when we look at Ephesians 5, look at right here, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Go to Ephesians 5, and then we'll also go to, uh, let's see right here, Romans 13. Ephesians 5 and Romans 13. If, think about this, no matter what dispensational timeline, don't you think God would want to hear you say, I'm sorry? Come on, man. <laughs> Come on, man. I mean, that's just common sense. David thought it was common sense. If he committed wrong, his common sense was, I'm sorry, God. Tribulation saying, common sense, I'm sorry, God. Christian church age, common sense is, I'm not, I won't say I'm sorry, God. Lack of common sense. Even unbelieving people know if they do wrong against somebody, common sense is, they don't have to be told to say I'm sorry. They know that they should say, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, go to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. And then we'll look at verse 12, verse 12. The Bible says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the what? Works of darkness. Verse 13, let us walk. Let us walk honestly. See, we can commit the right walk or the wrong walk. We can walk in darkness because verse 12, we're not supposed to be in the darkness when we walk. See that? Isn't that correct? Don't look at me like a tree full of owls. Like I say, again, look at verse 12 and 13 so that you don't get deceived by somebody online. All right, go to Ephesians 5.8. Ephesians 5.8. Ephesians 5.8. Paul, your apostle Paul, all right, to Christians. For ye were sometimes darkness. Oh, so look at that. You can commit darkness. But now are ye what? Light in the Lord. Okay, so I'll never be in the dark? No, walk as children of light. So even though you're not a child of darkness, which is what Paul's pointing out, you're a child of light. The thing is, though, when you walk, the way you act can be like the darkness, can be like the unbelievers. See that? So I am, no, I am not of sin. I am not a lost sinner, but I sure can act like one. See, that's the idea. I got to act like a saved believer. That's, right. that's the whole bottom line with Paul in this passage. So if you look at 1 John 1, look at that verse. That verse never said salvation here. See that? That verse never said salvation. One, John is including himself. See that? Who's already a saved believer. Two, he's talking about we walk in the light. This is all walk and fellowship. See that? Walk and fellowship, walk and fellowship, walk and fellowship. This has nothing to do with salvation in this passage. All right, we're going to look at Matthew chapter, uh, Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. Isaiah chapter 59. And then we'll look at verse 2. Uh, let's continue on. So your Christian walk you're, uh, for a lot of you who don't know, you're living a life of confession. You're living a life of confession. So in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, because the idea is confession means to say it publicly. What does that mean? In the eyes of other people. That's what God makes a big deal out of. He wants people to see it. So in Matthew 10, 32, the Bible says, Whosoever there sh uh, therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. Now, that verse shows God, Jesus Christ wants you to confess him publicly to the whole world. He makes a big deal out of that. Go to Jeremiah 20. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9. Now, Jeremiah, he got so bitter against God that he said, I'm not going to mention your name anymore. But what happened is because of that belief of his, see that? When you believe in something, sometimes you can't leave it well enough alone, especially if you believe it strongly. Amen. If you be, what you believe in, church, I do know this, all right? When you get back into the world, when you get back into the flesh, I mean, you're not really happy. Yeah. 
Because you got something that bothers you. Because you already believe in Bible-believing truth. So when you go to those other churches, when you hear other uh, wrong doctrines, when you go do the worldly things, and those beliefs differ from your belief, you're not at peace about it. So then what happens is it's like a fire that burns you. It bugs the life out of you that you can't stand it anymore, that some way out or another, even if you don't mean to, you're going to confess it. It's going to show. So in Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 9, the Bible says, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart. See that inwardly, as a burning fire shut up in my bones. See, you can't contain it inwardly anymore. And I was weary with forbearing, and I what? Could not stay. You can't keep it in. It has to come out. All right, now we're going to look at the methods of confessing Christ publicly. And then we'll wrap it up right here, okay? Now, this is really good. This is the really good stuff. There are several ways that you can confess before men. It starts out, as I mentioned before, out of your mouth, right? So from out of your mouth is showing confession. This confession, we see the definition here, it's before men. But even if I don't write before men, we know that the word confess automatically means it's before the eyes of the world or before men. But I'm just doing this for visual aid. So we see right here people who see you. People who see you. When they see you, how are you going to confess? Right? How are you going to confess? There are several ways. We already talked about two major ones, but several ways where they can see you confess Christ in their eyes. The first one, which I mentioned before, was baptism. That's why water baptism is important. That's why it makes so much sense why God wanted people to get water baptized as soon as they got saved, as soon as they did their first confession, believing on Christ for salvation. The reason why is he wants people, he wants you to show people, hey, I did get saved. Yeah. Remember, water baptism is not salvation. It's only a what? Picture of your salvation. So God, he wants you to picture. He wants you to show it immediately in the eyes of the world. Hey, I did get saved. Amen. I believe in Jesus Christ. death, burial, resurrection. That's why God wanted that practice. The second thing is witnessing, soul winning. Why? Because already out of your mouth, you're telling people you believe in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and you want them to. So how good is your confession? Do people know you believe in that? You, you hide it, see? You hide it. All right. Third one is praising him. Why do we sing hymns? Because it's a good way of confessing God that I recognize you are Lord. Thank you for saving my soul from hell. I believed in your death, burial, and resurrection, so I give you the glory. See, so praise is a good example of that. So... Think about this. Every, nearly every element of your, what you're doing as a Christian, Christian practice, is tied to confession. Did you notice that? So you have, so Jesus Christ wants that. That's important to him. How good is it in your life? You hide it well, don't you? That's not good. Fourth is preaching. What you're hearing right now is me telling you what I believe in. See that? I'm telling you what I believe in about the Word of God. I'm telling you what I believe in about the Gospel. I tell you everything that I believe in. As a matter of fact, that caused you to believe too. So preaching is so powerful. That's why we have preaching all the time at Sunday. Why? Because it's one hour long almost confessing Jesus Christ as Lord. That's the idea. Another one is, and the last one is testimony. Yeah. Testimony. So that's a no-brainer. I don't even need to tell you that. So how good is your testimony? Do they know? 
Do they know? How's your testimony? That's why we make a big deal about testimony. Because you're representing Jesus Christ. If people, see, if people don't see your Christianity, that shows how much you really believe in it. See that? So it shows how much it means to you. See that? People, uh, people know that this particular individual loves Taylor Swift, loves football, because the person won't shut up about it, because the people won't stop decorating items and posters about it, because people uh, will always spend time, a lot of time on it. Hey, anyone getting conviction or you're hearing what I'm saying here? Do they see that about Jesus Christ? Do they see that about your life? How's your testimony? Even uh, if you're backslidden, you know what's funny? True story. One person, backslidden, not right with the Lord, in a bar, you know, drinking himself silly, trying to act like the lost world. And then one person went up to him and asked him, are you a Christian? I mean, he didn't even pray, and he was just so shocked. You know why? Yeah. Jeremiah chapter 20. You're not the same as before once you believed. Yeah. And that's so much in you that it's convicting you. And you're not like the, lo the same like the lost world out there who are ignorant about sin, but you know about your sin, and that Holy Spirit's convicting you because of what you believe in. That cannot be shut up. One way or the other, it's going to leak. That's good stuff, yeah? So you're, uh, that's why we emphasize giving testimonies about people, how they got saved. People talk about how their prayers got answered by God. People quoting verses from the Bible. People just being happy, and then they see they, you got something real that they don't have. People who uh, were messed up in temptation and addictions, but then they testify about how God gave them victory against that. See, that's great examples of testimony, confessing Christ before men. What a wonderful testimony. Uh, I said that's the last one. I lied, sorry. The last one is altar calls. Now, I strongly believe in altar calls. I'll never quit altar calls. Even when I had like only three people in church, you know, two-third... Uh, uh, Two-third of our people will go on the altar. That's good. Praise the Lord. That's how it ought to be. And if they don't go, I go, all right? And that means one-third of our church people go to the altar. Praise the Lord, all right? But now I don't do much anymore because I'm preaching, and I don't get much guest speakers. And if I get guest speakers, I have to be the one to cover them at the end. But you got to realize, before I was a pastor, and if I don't have that responsibility of keeping the service going, I went to the altar every time. I don't care if the preaching didn't apply to me. You know why? I strongly believe in showing those people that that confession of Christ meant something to me, and I want to confess the same to all of you. Amen. I make a big deal about that, all right? I understand if some people uh, uh, don't show altar calls, but if some people are against me, kind of sometimes showing people coming on the altar... I do that because I want them to see our confession That's right. before Christ, before men. Remember, when you go on the altar, it's not that, oh, now everybody knows I messed up in that particular sin and they're going to look at me and I'll never be the same. One, who stinking cares? All right, then again, shame is holding you back. That's a problem. You want to confess it. Number two, no, sir or ma'am. It's not because you have that particular sin problem. It's because you want to show it to the eyes of the world that, hey, I agree wholeheartedly. I amen to that wholeheartedly as well. And I want to confess that to you because it means that much to me. One or two, you can at least thank God for that preaching. Or three, you can pray for somebody else who's going through that. All right. But the point is, is that do, uh, do we see your confession after preaching? How good's your confession after preaching? I, I don't care what people say online and criticize altar calls, all right? I don't believe in that. I strongly believe in altar calls. I'll die with altar calls, even if no one agrees with it, and I'm the only one in the altar, Come on. all right? Because I need an altar in my life. I don't know about you. So altar calls will always continue. May that continue. Have no shame. Don't, like, hide behind somebody and then keep yourself low, head bowed, eyes shut, so that no one, and you pretend no one's watching you. Confess it boldly and get down there. Amen. 
confess boldly. Get down over there. Now, the hindrances are very obvious. The hindrances, one, is fear of man. Fear of man. And that is in uh, John 7, 13. John 7, 13. The second one, obvious, is you're embarrassed. You're embarrassed. That's 2 Timothy 1, 8. 2 Timothy 1, 8. So notice these things are blocking. Blocking the person from seeing. See that? It's putting a block here. So they can't see your confession then. So these blocks, are they cleared from your life? The last one is guilt, believe it or not. You might go, that's surprising. Why does guilt block it? Because the reason why is why bother when I'm going to mess up again? I'm just too wicked. I don't think God will forgive me. I'm just too wicked. I don't think God can use my life where people can see anything good in me. See, so guilt, believe it or not, is an amazing, a very important factor. These are more common, but this one is very powerful that a lot of people don't realize. Guilt. So I would like to encourage the guilty person to just confess. The passages are Psalm 69, 3 through 7. Psalm 69, 3 through 7. And then verses 10 through 12. 10 through 12. And 30 to 33. 30 to 33. All right, hope you got a blessing. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I want to thank you so much for the truth of your word. This important doctrine of confession. Because this is our whole life that we're supposed to live. I pray that it will represent that as a good confession to this lost world, may we confess you as you pointed out in your word that you want us to confess you. So Lord, help us to confess you well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.